It's time for Geek Gamer Weekly. Center of the most calculating intelligence on Earth. The Uber Podcast, just for geeks and gamers. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. With your hosts, Joseph Falby. Men wanted to be like him. Women wanted to be with him. John Kessler. He will be talked about in the same way that Rockefeller and Carnegie and, and Ford are talked about. And Chase Nunes. For your information, butthead, he's headed for the video championships in Los Angeles. Now, live from Earth. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened then? It's Geek Gamer Weekly. This is Geek Gamer Weekly, episode 227, recorded on Monday, January 21st, 2013. Beta Bugs Bite. Geek Gamer Weekly is brought to you by Personas and the Persona Studio Live 1602 Digital Mixer that provides a complete solution for live and studio applications. For more information, visit personas.com. Hey everybody, welcome again to a, another edition of Geek Gamer Weekly. This is the Uber Podcast for Geeks and Gamers a special Monday Night Geek edition of the show. We have a great show lined up for you guys. As always, we bring our opinions to the table, and usually we're dead wrong, but that's what makes the show fun. Yeah. Uh, now, we have a, uh, a little bit of a different lineup this week because since it is a Monday edition, one of our cast of characters that is usually here, you hear his name in the credits all the time, is not here because he's at work. So, from one John to a John Garlow, back on the show after a long absence, and we're very happy to have him back. Here he is, folks, Mr. John Carlo Lindsay. Hey, John Carlo, what's going hello. on? How are you? I'm good. How are you? That's not what you're supposed to say. Happy New Year. That's not what you're supposed to say. Try again. <laughs> Keep going. Ah. What am I doing? How? Uh, you I'm know what? Fine. You know How what? Joe. You? Joe is going to. Uh, what Joe will do is when I get to Joe, Joe is going to uh, cover you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, so you're doing well, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about it maybe towards the end of the show. But uh, you started a new venture called GSRC, which mm-hmm. stands for Global Sim Racing. Channel. Global Sim Racing Channel, not the Jean Carlo Simulation Racing Channel. I wish. That'd be a good idea, actually. <laughs> you should totally do that. So, um, so we're we're ready to go, and we'll keep going. Green, 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 green. Next person on the show, uh, and uh, he was uh, up visiting this weekend at my humble homestead here in the Pacific Northwest of Washington State, and uh, he's back home now. Here he is, folks, Mister Joseph Falby from the Oregon Bureau of Technology and Gaming Research. Hey, Joe, how are things going for you? Doing good. That's good. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, it was fun. My arm hurt now. <laughs> my 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 arm seriously hurts uh, from from winging. Yeah, I was um, gonna say you might yeah. want to you know specify why your arm was hurting. Yeah, it's it's from from that that stupid throwing the ball at at you know using that that goofy scoop. Oh, thingy. is that what they're calling yeah. it now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, sometimes. Uh, anyway, <laughs> no, it was it was a good time. We played uh, Whirly Ball, and um, for those who haven't played it, basically you're in a bumper car, a little handle, and um, and then you have a uh, uh, a scoop. I, I can't remember the kind what they're called, but you have a scoop that, that a ball goes in, like a wiffle ball goes in, and you, and you got to throw it to each other, and you got to make it in this little basket or in this little uh, pocket in this backboard, kind of like basketball on bumper cars but you can't actually touch the ball you're not supposed to just google uh, just google it or youtube yeah google it. whirly ball you'll figure it out it's big on the east coast and i i don't think it's that big out here on the west coast but yeah um there is a place in seattle to do it or near seattle yeah and uh, so we did that that was a lot of fun and um then we went to a, a friend of yours house who has a, just an unbelievable collection of arcade games and uh pinball machines and other other amazing amazing stuff yeah arcade pinball Classic, like stuff. classic arcades, really yeah, classic. Not, really not like, cool. not like, yeah. like seventies classic arcades, like forties classic arcades. Yeah, I mean wow. some yeah. really classic arcade stuff. Just awesome, awesome stuff. Whole bunch of really cool things, and I uh, had a really a lot of fun out there. That so. cackling that you just heard 
is not tackling t- is a good word for it. Yeah, is not top shelf from ninety nine point nine KISW. No, it's uh, GFQ's own John Bub, or as we like to call him, Suncast. Hey, Suncast, how's it going? What up? How's it going? It's good, man. It's good. How how was uh how was your weekend? How did things go for you? Uh, it, it went all right. I guess. All right, man, three strikes uh, I and everybody's out. I built a new computer out. this weekend. And so I'm kind of like breaking it in now, but I still got to do some stuff to it. But this is kind of like the inauguration for it because this is the first time that I've done a show with it. Right. Everybody, everybody, um, everybody struck out. And why? Why, why Chase? How, how, how are you doing? You, thank you, know, Joe. I appreciate it. Thank you for how, how asking. How are you doing? Uh, 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 you, now you've No, no, out. I just said thanks. For, everybody. Thanks for That's asking. Everybody. Thanks for asking. I'm just yeah. ducky. Uh, yeah, but John never says that. No, he does that. He never says thanks yeah, for asking. Yeah, he does. He just says, I'm just ducky. Joe was I supposed to do it. all failed. Joe oh, I knew what stuck. I was supposed to do. Um, there was no question what Chase was fishing for. It's just that <laughs> aggravating Chase is an entertaining you know, thing to do. Nice Let, cover. Whatever. <laughs> You've already <laughs> No, I, anybody who knows now. Chase knows that aggravating Chase already screwed, so we, just stop now. Everybody go home. We're done. Yep. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Hey, let's do a show. Let's do that, shall we? All right, let's do that. Oh, we just did that. <laughs> Good night, Gracie. Didn't we all play yeah. it? <laughs> Good night, Gracie. <laughs> yes. All right, let's start. And Bob second. There we go. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about uh, John Bub's favorite topic, and that's BlackBerry and RIM. And uh, the RIM CEO uh, just announced, actually, today. You know, it's a Monday, it's a Monday story, so hey, hell, hell, why not? Research in Motion CEO, totally German newspaper, the company may be considering big changes. One of those big changes is the possibility of uh, opening up their OS to licensing. So it would allow you know, other companies to, to get in there and uh, use the operating system. So kind of like you know, a, a handset maker may want to license Android as a great example uh, to put on their handsets. BlackBerry, RIM, they're possibly considering that and with that announcement their stock went up 10 percent so you're supposed to buy yesterday or maybe friday or whatever so um i'm gonna go first with uh, with john here mr john bub you're you're the rim guy mm-hmm. i almost said something really really bad <laughs> john um what I do you, th- you what do you think about this announcement ruined. i know but what do you think about this announcement Oh, this is something that's been rumored for like two years now, and, and it's something that I think people have speculated for a long time is, is the fact that well, Rim could just save themselves if they were to license BlackBerry, much like they do with Android and Google. Right. So that's basically what they do with Android. They let anybody use it on their handset for a licensing fee or whatever it is, and, and they think that Rim should do the same thing. But I think when Thorsten Heinz originally took over the reins, um, people were like speculating, well, is this a good time for them to actually? move over to licensing BlackBerry. And it was still way before we had so many more details about BlackBerry 10. Right. And yeah. I think in a way, people kind of wanted it to happen, but Thorsten Hines wasn't really into it. And I still think now that they're doing BlackBerry 10, and I think earlier Thorsten Hines actually said that he wasn't necessarily ready to rule it out, but he wasn't also ready to really consider it because what they want to do first it's really get BlackBerry 10 out there before they would even really consider doing licensing options. So we have to wait and see how BlackBerry 10 is actually going to take the market and then go from there as far as how licensing goes. I think if it does badly, they might consider licensing. Yeah. But I think that's not necessarily an option that they want to go with. But that's I something mean, that but, BlackBerry has never wanted to do. But why, if, if it's something that they never wanted to do, why, we, why would you even flirt with the idea and bring the topic up at all? I mean, if it, I mean, if it's something that, yeah, maybe you're going to do down the road and, and quite possibly you're going to do down the road as a life-saving measure, sure, I'll give you that. Yeah. But but why even bring it up? I, a lot of it is it's just that people have been hounding Rim and Thorsten Hines over this question as far as wanting it. Because they kind of, in a way, think that, well, BlackBerry isn't necessarily the greatest with, with hardware. Their strength is also with software. So if they just license their software manufacturers can create great hardware for it and they don't have to worry about having an all-in-one house type of situation where because a lot a lot of what we were getting before is just massive delays with stuff 
and we still are to a degree where yeah. BlackBerry 10 is massively delayed. Well, but at the same time, BlackBerry 10 could be the savior for RIM. Well, we we said that last year. I mean, when towards the tail end of last year, we were saying, well, this could be the savior. This could be it. Joe, I mean, obviously, they're coming in at a time where companies are just leaving RIM. They're going to Android. They're going to iPhone. My former company was moving to iPhone from BlackBerry. Yeah, yeah we moved from BlackBerry. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've been been moving consistently, and and we I think we pretty much finished our move. I don't think we have any BlackBerry devices left. Right. But yeah, I I have a feeling this licensing idea is well, there's two sides to this. Uh, the the statement, you know, there, there's some people have made the statement that it, even if they license it for like ten dollars a device, which would be fairly high, they make more money on that per device when they sell an actual device. But I think what people aren't paying attention, or what people are ignoring, or not not really paying attention to, is that RIM stands to make more money in the long run from their enterprise software, from BlackBerry Enterprise Server. Right. And that that has a a usage outside of just BlackBerry devices. They've expanded that subtle little work with multiple mul mobile devices, iPhones and Windows Phone and, and Android devices. So I think they have a more of a future in that realm than they ever, ever really do in BlackBerry 10 devices. Um, I think BlackBerry 10 is really just the last grasp for them. And, uh, you know, realistically, I, I don't see how they can survive. The The biggest issue, I think, is the way they approach their mobile platform as opposed to the other ones, uh, to to Android and, and Google and uh, – or Android and, and Windows Phone and, and iOS, is those phones all directly connect to the Internet. And as far as I know, BlackBerry stuff still all has to go through that one cluster of servers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, they've, you know, diversified it and they've moved it and it's in multiple places and stuff like that. But – you know, everybody, I think everybody who was using BlackBerry back, I mean, it's a few years ago now when they had that major outage that took down every BlackBerry device all around the world for, you know, several hours, still has a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. And who can blame them? Uh, I mean, that's a terrible, terrible idea. And all we're waiting for is that same sort of thing to happen again. So I, I think RIM's days are numbered. Yeah. If they really want to make it, they got to push. This device licensing is is not really going to do it. The market's already too crowded as it is, especially for consumer phones. You're right. The only thing they're really going to be able to do is uh, is push this, the BlackBerry Enterprise stuff, because I think that has real potential. That managing I iPhones, managing you know, managing uh, bring your own device type of setups, their tools could be really powerful for that if there will if people are willing to give them another try. John Carlo, do you think? The number, uh, the numbers are um, the the numbers are numbered. The days are numbered uh, for Rim here. This, I mean, last year we were talking about how all right, BlackBerry ten, it's good, it could save the company. It probably won't, but it could. I mean, is 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 this it? Is this the the beginning of the end in your opinion? Yeah, I, you know, I'm I'm pretty much on board with exactly what you know Joe says. Is you know, I I I stopped using a BlackBerry in two thousand nine. And I didn't look back. I mean, all of the new touch phones for consumers and stuff like that, it's just oh, it's just not you know, they're all they're all easier to use. The right. the interfaces, the, the the things to do, even though the, we we have problems. Well, they still. haven't updated in like three years. Exactly. So. And, and you know, it's just it's cumbersome. Yeah. It's cumbersome for, for a regular consumer unless you're like Joe said, unless you're in the enterprise or, or business thing, it's even then it's it's starting to lose focus. Uh, I I think you know, with with them trying to push BlackBerry ten, this this obviously is their their last ditch effort here, and if it doesn't succeed, the whole licensing thing, yeah, it probably will occur, and I think they would have to give it away. I think they couldn't sell it. They would have to give it away to try to regain the market share that they've lost. Now, they're still very, very big. They do have a significant chunk of market share, but it's been slipping. If you look at the numbers and you look at the history, it has been slipping. So, There's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's in a way sad because they have been so stagnant for the last two oh, three yeah. years. And, and I think that's been a major downfall because, I mean, really what they're doing should have came, come it out like came years two, ago. three years ago. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think if they had done that, that would have been good. I mean, there's, there's plus and minuses. In, in a way, it, they're... They could be peaking at the right time because some people are sick of like Android and iPhone, so it could be a good deal for them. But we won't know until it actually happens. Right. But I, I guess always, we'll find out more on January thirtieth. I always wondered, and, and this might be a little tangent, but I always wondered why Android wasn't. I, I mean, you, you can root 
your Android and you can get different ROMs and stuff. But I always wonder why it wasn't such like a really open source platform that for, well, for like enterprise Because Google's people. evil, remember? Well, no, Google's no, well, evil now. Well, no, to be fair to Google, they yeah. wanted it to be more open than it is. Right. Yeah. But the carriers insisted they lock it down. Yeah. Well, because they'd allowed the iPhone onto their onto their markets and they had realized how much control they lost over that. And with they were used to having, you know, you buy the same exact handset from two different carriers and you have a completely different user experience on each handset because the carrier mm-hmm. modified it to suit their needs. Right. And that was what they wanted. They wanted to be able to force you into their ecosystem and their, you know, their store and their music area and all that kind of garbage. But but it makes me wonder if can they apply an open source kind of platform for the enterprise user, just for the enterprise users? I, I think they'd have uh, you you then you're talking about people having to buy, um, buy the phone un, uh, un you know un fully fully paid unlocked for, un, yeah. unlocked completely yeah. unlocked and and not not at all with any kind of subsidy like it, on it from the yeah. phone carrier. Yeah. And the problem is, even I mean, unless you're a huge business, you're still not necessarily willing to do that because it means losing a lot of a lot of money. I mean, you're still paying the phone carrier. Remember, you're still paying the phone service the same amount of money, whether you're buying it subsidized or unsubsidized. But if you're buying it subsidized, you you gain that money on the front end. You pay them back on the long end. If yeah. you just are paying the phone company straight out, you don't get a discount for bringing your own device. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a hard sell, I think, uh, to, to, the, to the big companies to do that, especially when, when you're talking about a BlackBerry device. Now you have to add in addition to your exchange server, whatever mail system you already have, you have to add a, an enterprise server to manage your BlackBerry devices. And, and of course, RIM charges a lot of money for that. Now, again, with the, the enterprise server now being able to, able to manage multiple devices, multiple types of devices, it makes a little more sense. But you still have to buy that device. You can't just use the inbuilt management tools that are in Exchange or the inbuilt management tools that are in, in Apple's uh, uh, server system. So, so what you're saying is damned if you do, damned if you don't? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> I, th- I think Google had the right approach, but they couldn't break into the phone market without appeasing the carriers and the handset makers. Yeah. And, uh, and by trying to make a, a phone platform as open as they could, they ended up just shooting themselves in the foot in terms of how – the the carriers and the and the handset makers ended up manipulating the system, but I I do think an open platform for for RIM might work in the long run. Uh, it's just I, too I little think about, too late now. It's, it's it, it might be too little too late. I mean I think about WebOS how much I really really liked WebOS oh, yeah. and when when HP open sourced it, now there's some real active projects on bringing that back and making it work on multiple handsets. I mean they've had it they have it running on the Nexus Seven. They've got it running on a a couple of example handsets stuff like that. But at the same time, that's out there. We have um, uh, we have Ubuntu working on their new phone system and their yeah. new app system, and that Which honestly, that, awesome. that's super and promising. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking, I'm gonna pick up one of those for my next phone. I mean, I I, I got to cover the microphone on my iPhone so it doesn't hear me say that. But you know, I'm, <laughs> it it just looks like such a sweet design. Steve and that Jobs just rolled in his grave. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those, I doubt. Uh, I don't think you know, any of those phones will see the, the light of day. Open phone of that we were promised from the beginning. What's that, Suncast? I don't. I don't think we'll see any of those see the light of day. Quite honestly, I, I, and even I Paul we'll Perot on what the tech has said that year. there's just not enough room in the market right now for something like that. Well, no, remember I, I think, they still have market share. I mean, we can't totally count well, them Rim out does. yet. They still have market share. Yeah, they're yeah. still Rim there. Does. I think. I think, John, you're talking about the um, about the Ubuntu, Ubuntu phone that we'll we'll probably yeah. never see an Ubuntu phone. Yeah, and yeah, and I mean, I think, it's almost like the mythological Facebook phone, you know. Well, I think we'll see an Ubuntu phone, but it may only be a super limited release. Uh, you know, high end. You know, people who are are willing to spend a lot of time hacking and and stuff like that, beating on the phone to try to get it to do everything they want. I don't yeah, think we'll ever I think see best it, if it as an option. It's going to be much like Palm Pre. I I don't I think it'll be in, in, in terms of success. Uh, you know, it's really hard to say. The nice thing about it is because it's based in Linux, there's a huge push behind that from the open source community. So you can get a lot of tools there that, that are available for free on that platform that aren't available on other platforms or, or cost a lot of money on other platforms. So I think we'll see a huge pickup from the open, from that open source community. And if enough of those people pick it up and they drive enough of the mark of the store, we might see it coming to other carriers. But I don't think we're ever going to be to the point where you can walk into an AT&T store or a Sprint store and say, I want my Ubuntu phone. 
I think they're going to look at you and say you're you're a boa <laughs> yeah. now. It, it, to me, to me, the Ubuntu, Ubuntu phone just seems more like a Raspberry Pi. Like a lot of enthusiasts and tech geeks are just going to pick it up and play with it if they can. But the Ubuntu but I think phone, those those enthusiasts and tech geeks can drive the market if if they manage. So the the thing that'll sell a phone Killer now. Apps. Killer yeah, apps. I think the thing that'll sell a new phone is the App Store, and that's why you know, like Windows Phone didn't see very much adoption yeah. because the, the App Store was basically non-existent. There this, was there were apps, but there weren't very many there. And I think if we if we see enough enough enthusiast developers push apps out for it, we could see more widespread adoption. But then the problem is going to be the, the same case for say, BlackBerry Ten when it launches too. Is that there might not be yeah. uh, a great app experience out there? They just renamed it to BlackBerry World, and yeah. they're still trying to entice uh, developers to create all these applications for it. They say they have like 92,000 apps for BlackBerry 10, but I, I don't even think that 92,000 at start is going to be a great number for them. They need to have like 300,000. Well, you can't have, you, you have 92,000 apps and have 80,000 of them be the fart control. I mean, you yeah. know, that's the problem that some of the phones have had is, is yeah, we have thousands of apps. The problem is, is the first 8,000 of them all replicate exactly the same functionality. For and it's no hard reason. when you have the iPhone and Android out there that have well-established app stores. Yeah, yeah, and I mean Microsoft had to had to completely push people to, uh, you know, to this new this new system for not just for their for their phone yeah. but for yeah. Windows in order to get enough support to drive their their phone platform. This... I'm not sure how much of you, how much you guys follow BlackBerry, but I, I've been seeing a lot of articles lately about this portathon thing that they're doing, and I've seen this like portathon thing extended. Two or three times in the last three months, it was supposed to be like done three months ago, and it, it's still going on. They keep extending it, and to me, that sounds very interesting. Like they're just trying to make this giant push, and and they're just not meeting the the demand that they're looking for. I, I know we're getting past our time that we need to move on to. Well, I was story. I was trying to transition to this perfect topic, and here's the transition that I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Giancarlo. Now, the, the transition is we were talking about hardware, and if it's good hardware and the demand is there, people will buy it. A great example of that is the Nexus 4 phone. They, uh, Google uh, made 400,000 last... Th th now, this is an estimate. 400,000 last quarter. The, the demand for this phone is 10 times what Google expected. Why? It's just a phone. It's just some plain hardware. Is it because possibly that it's an unlocked phone? Is it because it's running a pure Android experience with with no bloat and no carrier influence whatsoever? I mean... Or is, or is it just that Google marketed it on their search page like mad for a while? I don't know. <laughs> I, they didn't really have to market the Nexus They, they did, 4. though. If you went to their search page and, and did a search from a, from other devices or, or yeah. that sort of thing, it would pop up and say, you know, you could get a better Google experience with a Nexus device. You know, I, I, they push their Nexus platform pretty hard, but no, I think the other the other big reason is it's not a uh, a gimped out carrier controlled modified yep. super manipulated yep. phone. Yeah. Um. You know, I I went through two different Android devices. I, I had a um. I talked about it on the show a while ago. I had a I had a uh, Kindle Fire Ten for uh, about four days, and it just annoyed the heck out of me, and I couldn't stand it, even though it's an Android phone. It just bothered. Well, they me. had that stupid interface on there. Yeah, it was just just aggravating. And now I have a, a Nexus Four, and I like it just or a Nexus Seven. I like it just fine. Um, I don't think it's as good as my iPad or my my touchpad, but I, it's a lot better than what the Kindle Fire was. And and I, that's the same experience I had with with my old Android phone that I had a while ago. Was it was just a a crappy UI that the that that in that case Motorola had to put on the phone because they can do whatever the heck they want with it. Yeah. yeah. So. I would get a Nexus 4 before I'd get any other Android phone, but I'm not going to get a Nexus 4. I want a Nexus 4. I actually do. I want one, and you know I can't buy one right now. Or if you go on Craigslist, you're going to pay $150 a premium because people know that the, the phone's in demand right now. I'll just wait patiently. You know, One phone that uh, a lot of people are not buying right now is the iPhone 5. Right now, you, you can't say a lot of people are not buying. You can say it's not selling as many as some analysts predicted. Okay, fine. It's still selling a lot more than the <laughs> Nexus Four. That that's I'll an Apple that stockholder spinning yeah. it in a positive direction. <laughs> if I ever did hear one. Well, I mean, seriously though, you can, it's not selling at all, except for the tens of millions. I didn't say it wasn't sold. selling. I just said is, demand is, is weak. 
uh, I read that's not that, what you said. Let's roll back the tape and find. Uh, I don't. I don't have a, a GSRC uh, instant replay, so I, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a, a podcast producer making an excuse. Oh well, you know, hey. <laughs> trying to spin it the best way you can. Yeah. What? Well, what? Well, well, well. <laughs> But the stock fell. The the stock declined to its lowest price in eleven months, Mister Stockholder. Are you? Uh, I know you're sweating. That's why you're a little little upset because your your stock price went down. That's it's still five hundred dollars. Yes, yes. It it drops to the low low price of five hundred dollars. Um. So it's now time to buy, is what you're saying? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, depending on which analyst you talk to. Um, one of the one, a couple of them are saying, you know, it's a not buy, and then there's a couple that are really outspoken that are saying, look, based just on cash on hand, it should be seven hundred and seventy dollars a share. Right. So, you know, I mean, that's that's what it really comes down to, isn't it? But yeah, that's true. That's what it comes down to. You're right. Uh, so I don't know. And there's a lot of the other thing too is Apple's trying to rectify some of this by pushing increasing their their product rotation, but. Um, and I think that's maybe what people are waiting for is they they have such a history of a new device every nine to 12 months in every product family, except for the Mac Pro, apparently. <sighs> um, Why is that? I have no idea. I mean, seriously. Uh, I, I mean, I was talking to John Carlo about this, I think, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it they haven't up to... It keeps them always in the press, always something new. <laughs> No, no, no. You're talking about why they haven't updated the uh, the Mac the Pro. Mac Pro, yeah. And I'm talking about the tower people. I, I think I think the reason they haven't updated the Mac Pro is there hasn't been a huge jump in, um, in that architecture. Oh, in the, the desktop processor. No, bull. there has in in Xeons there hasn't. Oh, been. in Xeons, yes, you're right. Because that's in what Xeons. the Mac Pro runs. It doesn't run i5s. It doesn't run desktop processor. It runs server level processor. Yeah, if you want a desktop processor, you get an iMac. You're getting an iMac or a, a Mac Mini. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So. So yeah, that's I and I think that's what the issue is 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 they're they're still waiting on Intel to release the Ivy Bridge or the next gen chips in the Xeon platform and Intel has been taking freaking years to do that at this point. Well, go shout so, out our chat room is saying that Tim Cook stated last year that they're going to update yeah. the MacBook. I'm sorry, MacBook. The, sorry. the Mac Pro. Yeah. It's on the brain. Yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, it is. I mean, it's way overdue for an update. So they yeah. will be updating it this year for sure and hopefully soon. Yeah. Um but uh, that is other one things you're going to be doing I is my own computer is that it's just unmatched as far as what you can actually buy out there right now. You can just build something that's so much more powerful. I mean, I know, I know it's illegal or against terms of service, but I built a Hackintosh computer just because I can get more bang for my buck hardware wise yeah. than yeah. what Apple Apple can 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 give me. Well, you you built a a Mac. You built it, but when you built it, you built it with Compared to the Mac Pro, desktop relatively right. It's low not ed, server, not right. high, high. You know, not not high reliability parts. Right. Yeah. And you have to remember that's what these the, the Mac Pros are not meant for a consumer. They're not meant for you. They're meant for a video production house. They're so, meant for a, right. a really, really an actual really high end user. So let me not, ask you this, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I mean, since you're, you're you're obviously you're the Apple guy, you know a lot about this. Here I am. Okay, I you you already know me. You know my setup. I I, I don't want an iMac because I don't need an, a computer with another screen. The Mac Mini, okay, is uh, isn't powerful enough to what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. So where what do I do? Well, DX9S points out that Apple should make maybe they should make a product between the two, but I I think that the issue the thing is is most people. The, and I'm talking about the average consumer. I know. We I are know. not the average consumer. I think that's oh, I important know. to keep in mind. Yeah, that is true. You're right. Um, Didn't we are they, not the but average consumer. there is consumer. a market out there for people like us. Yes. No, and and not, that's what I asked you, you, look Joe. At the yeah. Tony Mac but there's forums, not a market there for people, people like us. There's not a market rigs. for people like us from any of the computer makers. Go find a Dell that you can build to your specifications and be anywhere near the price you can build it yourself. You're, it's just not going to happen. The best you're going to be able to do is build a build a Mac Mini and level, level machine for not that much money, less than a thousand bucks, or you're going to be able to buy a much higher end machine, but still doesn't have a really good video card in it, but it comes with like a whole bunch of other garbage. So uh, they're falling in line where the rest of the computer industry, the computer makers are, but they're not falling into where the gaming enthusiasts, where the enthusiast people are, because we build our own computers, I and mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And the closest you're going to be able to find in terms of performance is going to be a Mac, Mac Pro level machine. 
but, but it doesn't matter who you buy it from. If you want a machine with that kind of performance, you're not going to be able to buy it for a reasonable price from any maker. Do you think that is that kind of why do you think perhaps that Apple, you would think that they would have the power to shut down that Hackintosh community somehow, some way, maybe on uh, an encryption level. I don't know. I mean, I don't know much about that side of things, but well, well, maybe, they go they ahead. do it to some degree. They've yeah. done it. They've done it with the ones that are that are blatantly selling Macs. That, yes, that's you true. Know, clones. They've done that with companies. Yeah, I'm not talking about right. that. I'm talking about the home. The the home. Yeah, you're talking about people who are building it at home. I right. don't think it's a big enough threat to them to really worry too much about it. Um, if you're selling a product, though, so if, if you're doing it and not making any money, I don't think they care. If you're doing it and you're you're making a pr a big profit on it, you know, you're selling a, a hardware piece that enables other people to do it. Right. They're going to come down on you because that profit is not something you should be getting. Right. But in terms of a community doing it themselves, I don't think I don't think Apple cares. It's such a small percentage of their overall sales yeah, that they, it doesn't it doesn't have a, a significant impact. John they'd, much, they'd much rather sell the OS rather than, you know, a mid level Well remember there were there were big call outs for, for Apple to sell the OS just straight up. Hey, let me install it on my PC. I mean this was a couple well, of and, years ago. And technically you can yeah. Um, you can buy the so the the issue is is people like you when you went out and, and bought your Mac your your Mac copy right you bought uh, the upgrade copy which was twenty bucks but was really specifically an upgrade for a previous version of Mac right so the way to do it legitimately and not actually be breaking I mean you're still breaking the you can't use it on non Apple hardware but you're not breaking the upgrade license part of it is to go out and buy the uh, I think it's a hundred and fifty bucks or something like that, and it comes with like Mac. Uh, you can actually uh, still physically buy it. Y well, I don't know if yeah, you you can buy that version of it, and it comes with a version of of whatever Apple's. I can't remember Apple's Office software right now, um, but it comes with that, you know, uh, Pages and Keynote, and it comes with those those pieces of software, and it includes a micro an Apple license, a oh, software license. Okay, I didn't know. And that. then I think after you buy that, though, then I think you have to do the upgrade through the App Store. Okay. Um. I'm, but I'm not sure because I've never done it. I've always had a legitimate Mac. Yeah. I've never, never in my life built a Hackintosh. Yeah. And I mean, and, and I will be fully honest and upfront. Okay. If I could buy a, uh, you know, something better than a Mac Mini, Mac Mini, not as expensive as an outdated, in my opinion, Mac Pro, and uh, and not a iMac because I don't need a computer with a screen built in, I would buy it. I would Apple. I mm -hmm. would. I promise you, I would. But obviously, the demand's not there for this. I guess. I guess you call me a niche market. I'm a niche. Well, it is. Yeah. yeah I mean, right. the yeah. the only thing that'll drive it is if if uh, if Steam and if so if game developers and stuff like that get more serious about putting games on Mac, and there's a real need for a high performance gaming level machine or a machine that you can buy at a low end and install a high performance graphics card in. Right, that will drive that market. Yeah, but as it is right now, there's nothing really pushing it. Yeah, <sighs> I mean, it, it's, yeah. It's what do you do? Spot. I mean, yeah. it, it's a rough spot to be on. Yeah. Uh, but again, the I, the Mac Pros are not oriented towards consumers; they're oriented towards people who are doing real video work. And those people, they will not buy, or they will not build a Hackintosh video work? because it it breaks too many licensing. Huh? Go ahead. Are you saying I don't I don't do real video work? Uh, <laughs> when was the last time you did a feature film? I do so a about, lot how of about encoding. Just a, how about just a broadcast television show? Uh, you know what? See, this is the thing. is because you're talking about broadcast and cinema stuff. But yeah. in reality, a lot of the web, web content out there now is 720p. You have to basically do your stuff in 720p. And if you're yeah, using well, something like Adobe After Effects, that's even more intensive on your hardware. Well, and and I have a I have a cousin in Hawaii who actually does television production. He has several TV shows that he does, and and he does commercials along with them and stuff like that. And and he uses a real true Mac Pro, and he uses uh, um, what uh, uh, Cinema. God, why can't I think of what it's called today? Um, <laughs> you know, he uses the the video editing software, and he uses Avid? uh, a, a, hmm, was it called Avid? No, no, no. He doesn't. He used Avid for a while, but then he moved to Final Cut Pro. Final Cut, yeah. Back, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so he uses Final Cut Pro, and he uses. Uh, actually, I don't know if he does or if he has a uh, uh, somebody who who works with him who uses the uh, motion for for that sort of thing. But that's what he uses, and he will not build a Hackintosh because when he's putting content out there that needs to be 
um, you know, that may get large scale exposure, television audiences, stuff like that. You know, we're not talking about thousands of viewers. We're talking about, you know, potentially millions of viewers. If somebody were to come back and say, hey, are you sure you're licensed for all that stuff? It's just something that he's not going to want to deal with. And that's the same for anybody who's doing media on that sort of on that sort of scale. Right. Yeah. You know, they don't want to have to deal with that issue. And you know what? Honestly, when it comes down to it at that point, buying a, a two or three thousand dollar Mac Pro is not that expensive anymore. Our final geek story is a little light one or big one. Or I'm not trying to poke fun at the dude. But Mr. Kim.com, uh, you know, he was that whole mega upload mess and he was arrested. And Well, he's got a new venture that uh, he's launching. And his new, uh, his new site has already have 500,000 users who signed up for the beta this uh, in the first 14 hours. Now, this site, uh, which is, um, uh, what's it called? Oh, gosh. Mega. Mega, thank you. Uh, will give users, I believe it's 50 gigs of, of space, of, of sharing space. The uh, music industry condemns the move. I think, you know, having space in the cloud is important. I know Google's ever increasing, the, you know, the, the space of their cloud drive. I, I know that Microsoft at a time, I don't know if they still do, offer 25 gigs of space with their iCloud drive as well. Um. Is this a big deal at all? I mean, 50 gigs? I mean, we're probably going to see other companies doing it. The, the problem I have with these cloud they doing now. Yeah, the problem that I have... Box on that gives you 50 gigs. Oh, it's 50 now, because I, I know that it was 25 for a time. But it, the one thing that worries me about cloud-based services, even when there's terms of service, and even though it's encrypted or whatever, what if that service goes belly up or a drive fails or whatever the case may be? I know a person that backed up their data to a backup plan, a crash crash plan. Crash plan. And they had a major hardware failure at their facility and they lost his data. <laughs> well, maybe maybe you shouldn't go with newer companies. Go with a big established one that's been around for a while. Yeah. You know, I I mean this is a he's I, I mean who knows how he's going to be because he's been here before, he's done this before. So his business is obviously going to take off at, at least initially. Yeah. But who knows what he's building on the back end to support it? Um, but compare that to um, a place like Dropbox; uh, they're they're really pretty big, um, and they have apparently have have had really really good support. Uh, or of course Google. Yeah. Uh, Google or um, Apple has a bunch of data centers now for their iCloud stuff. Microsoft, of course, Microsoft. You know, I mean, I would say that's the that's the thing is right. Don't go with the fly by night little tiny company that says all we accept is PayPal. That's probably a bad sign. <laughs> or, or we so. we can't accept PayPal at this time. Yeah, uh, yeah. All we accept is PayPal. Except that our PayPal account is shut down right now because so, it's, it's uh, you old company failed. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say that again, John. I, I I just think it's it's a new company. It's not that it's not big or small. It's just it's new. It's, and it, it's, well, it's, it's, it's own old company got busted. It, to be honest, Mega Upload was a huge, huge, huge file host. Oh, yeah, and a lot of people used it legitimately. They didn't use it illegitimately and for music sharing or software sharing. They used it legitimately. Um, so we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, it's one of those things that, will I sign up for an account? Maybe. You, you know. know, when it comes to that kind of stuff, and, and I'm really particular, is that I don't necessarily like Dropbox. I mean, it, it's okay, I guess, but... Like, see, part of my problem, and I know I'm not the average user, but a lot of times these companies that do these cloud storage solutions, they only let you upload like a few hundred megabytes yeah. at, for, for each file. That's true. And, and that's it. But if I want to back up like large videos that I've edited and I just need to have them backed up, well, I can't do that. Or they you're using they, they it as something that's over a gig. Or you're using it like a Dropbox, where let's say, for example, uh, you know, I'm having you edit my video for me, John. I could go ahead and take my 20 gig video file, put it up there. I mean, yeah, I have a, but I have a fiber connection. I put it up there on the on the on the cloud, and you're able to pull it down. A lot of the services don't let you put big files like that. <laughs> they don't let yeah. you do that. Then I would have to FTP or something to my server or whatever. But even even if that's not the case, I mean, let, let's go from the other side. Let's say that I've got a movie that I've legitimately got on my computer that I want to change over to be compatible with my phone, my iPhone, for instance. Right. But it's like 600 megabytes big. 
mm-hmm. and I just want to be able to grab that from from the internet from the cloud. Yeah. Well, you can't do that at most places because they don't allow anything over the over 200 megabytes. That's true. You're right. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens to Mr. Kim dot com. John, you should really change your name to doc, Mr. Dot com. I think that's a good name. Dot com. I actually used the name nickname a long time ago. Dot com John. Dot com John. This was back when uh, I, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but like in like 1999, there was a guy that legally changed his name to dot com guy. And basically was like one of the forerunners for all this streaming and stuff and live streaming. He locked himself like in a house for an entire year. It kind of like a big brother. Oh, I remember. Kind of like Big Brother. Kind of like Big Brother, but it was just one guy. Like a Big Brother rewind kind of a thing. <laughs> hey, let's move on, shall we? Let's let's talk some gaming topics. And uh, before you know it, E3 will be here uh, in June. It's 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 huge. Um, and there are already rumors circulating that the big companies like Sony and Microsoft are going to release their new consoles. They're going to debut them at E3. Well, Sony has already come out. Well, I should say the rumor is at this point that Sony will not be revealing anything about a PS4, a PlayStation 4, until Sony announces the next Xbox. So Microsoft announces. Right. Yeah. yeah. What did I say? You said Sony. Sony. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Um, Which would be kind of entertaining. That would be kind of entertaining. <laughs> we will not announce they anything switch until places. we... Sony should introduce the Xbox. Microsoft should introduce the PS4. Or, we will not announce anything <laughs> until we announce something. Yeah. So just want to let everybody know. Is this significant? Joe and I were having a, a little conversation in the, in the pre-show, pre-show about this where console gaming is evolving to the point where it's not really that significant per se, on a gaming scale, you know, these boxes now are turning into everything. You know, they're turning into home media hubs. I mean, just look at the dashboard of the Xbox 360 alone. They have video apps and audio apps and TV and advertisements, apps and everywhere. advertisements everywhere, which Joe yeah. hates, yep. even when you're paying for an Xbox Live Gold account. Yep. Yep. I um, pay you $60 a month so you can give me ads that are specific to what I want. Yes, Joe. Like Madden. We know. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Joe. Um, <laughs> so... Is this a big deal, Sony saying, uh, ah, we're not going to say anything until Microsoft does? It's like little kids playing in yeah, the sandbox. Does it, it? does it matter? Does it really? I, in my opinion, no. I mean, it's not going to. Uh, I, it's, I get, it's not like they're going to see the Microsoft announcement and then go, oh, crap, we got to go back we to the make a change. and redesign the whole thing. Right. Well, <laughs> it's it's one of those things like uh, a football game, right? You know, there's the coin toss. Do you want to kick or receive? Uh, we want to wait and see what they say. No, <laughs> and then do the opposite. Right? No, it doesn't work that way. Well, so, maybe they just don't have whatever it is that they're planning to announce just quite ready yet. They're ready. They're ready. They just—it's like you know—you're getting in an argument. You want the last word, right? Doesn't I guess Sony wants the last word? They, well, they've both said they would. Their systems would have ten-year uh, shelf lives. Right. And so, with them announcing it. They still have another year for release. Right. So they could, I mean, they're not, like Joe said, they're not going to go back and re- redesign it, but they might make software concessions where they want to keep it closer together. Does this matter, though, when you have a, a company like NVIDIA? And I don't have a story in the rundown about this. But when you have a company like NVIDIA who announced uh, a new platform, you know, a new handheld hardware platform, and then you also have a company like Valve introducing their Steam box. I mean, gosh, the competition's really going to get thick, right? Yeah. I mean, Joe. I well, mean, no, what, yeah. well, it, or John. Go ahead, Joe. John. Joe. Well, John. Joe. Well, I was just going to say that it's interesting. They they think it's going to be a ten year lifespan, but I don't I don't know how long. Yeah, I, you know the thing that struck me, and, and this is what I said before the show, is that you know when the last gen consoles were were announced, and uh, all the way back from the beginning, when when they announced the generation of consoles, people looked at it and they said, "Holy smokes, the graphics are fantastic! It's amazing! I'd have to build a you know five thousand dollar computer to get anywhere close to that." And you know it's been that way all the way back from the the original NES. I mean the NES and the SNES and the um, you know all those those platforms, the graphics were fantastic, and they were way above anything you get on the PC for any kind of reasonable price. And now we've sort of reached the point where you can build a three five hundred dollar PC that'll do everything the current gen consoles will do, and it'll look better doing it. And yeah. 
and you know, I mean, we're reaching the point where the next gen is going to be announced, and the tech demos they have may look pretty good, but it's going to be short lived. You know, by the end of the year, the end of the announce year, we'll have hardware on the PC, and we already have hardware on the PC for that matter. That's going to be a pro. That's going to be cost effective. That'll provide better equal or better graphics than anything you can get on a console. And with Windows 8, the installation of those games uh, will be really easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I don't think consoles are as relevant as they were. I think no. they're still, a, obviously, they're still a huge driving force, but it, it's kind of weird to think about. You know, just a couple years ago, we were talking about the death of PC gaming, the consoles were going to take over. And now, you, I mean, where are consoles going to go from here? Obviously, better graphics, but... Well, they're turning into entertainment hubs. That's where they're going. They're yeah. they're turning into well, Netflix, they, 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 Amazon. Why would I buy a five hundred dollar console as a enter- entertainment hub when I could go buy a hundred dollar Apple TV or a hundred dollar Google device or a- because th- that can't play games because that can't play disced movies. It cannot play. Well, but- but uh, you're not um, going to get Halo on a Steam box. You're not going to get right. But you know, what Huckabee Grand- mentions is a really good point: is with AirPlay mirroring and a Bluetooth wireless controller, you could. You're playing it on your PC, but you're driving it to your monitor, and you're using a Bluetooth controller. You could play that game on your TV. But you, you obviously have to have the, the the hardware, and the entry point for that kind of hardware, the price It's 100 point. bucks. No, but $100 is not going to play Battlefield 3 at 1080p. No, well, obviously not. But you're if you're, if you're talking no, no. about... So you're going to buy a $500 console, modern-gen console, or you buy a $300, $400 PC that'll get the job done, and a hundred dollar, you won't get the Apple same TV work. or Google device. But you won't get the same frame rate. You will not get the no. same graphics performance. There's no way you'll get you would, way more versatility, though. You, you, that's true. I'm not denying that. But I'm so saying the this argument much. of people buying a console as a media hub is absurd. But it's an it's but an I extra. Think you're only about it, two it's different can't. types of people here. You're talking about the serious hardcore gamers that want the fastest stuff possible for the most hardcore gaming. But then you're also talking about appealing to people that are not as serious of gamers but still would like to do some occasional gaming and still be able to do some other stuff for it as well. Yeah. Somewhat of a combination between a gaming device and something like a Roku or Apple TV device that does gaming and the entertainment stuff. Yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of multi-purpose going on with I mean there already is with the Xbox and the PS3 and with a lot of these lower end $100 machines it's more it's like Chase said you're only going to be watching like some of this, you know, like stuff like websites or or movies or or, or shows like that because that's that's what they're targeted for. For the Xbox and the PS3, you're going for gamers that want to connect with their friends, want to connect with people across the internet, and say, "Hey, let's play some games. Hey, let's watch some movies together. Let's talk about it and let's do all that." Because you you can't just ignore the infrastructures that these these systems bring. And, and just say that these boxes are just hardware for these things. So there's there's a lot of that going on that you know really drives the the sale for a user. Yeah. Or for the kids. I think they're trying to figure out that market a little bit too. I, I don't think they've really decided or found a way to satisfy that sort of market. Well, regardless of what we think, there will be a new console released. Probably this year, or at least at minimum announced this year from Sony, from uh, that little company called Microsoft. And also we're going to see Valve get into it and NVIDIA get into it more. It's going to be a great year when it comes to hardware for gaming. No doubt about it. Even if you want to remain a PC gamer, which I still will be, uh, there's going to be advances in the video card arena as well. So really, it's exciting. Now it's time to remove our caps bow our heads, and have a moment of silence because Atari is filing for Chapter 11. Longtime video maker Atari announced, uh, and they are filing for bankruptcy tonight, or actually tonight. They actually did, they just did it about a few minutes ago, and will begin a sale of its assets in the next few months. This is according to Fox Business, uh, and this is intended to help the company operate independently uh, now, Atari's switched hands uh, through the years, um, and uh, they are owned uh, currently a uh, parent company is Infogrames, and then they changed their name uh, to Atari SA in 2003. Uh, they did make a shift to mobile games uh, in 2011. Uh, they had profits at $11 million, but they only had profits last year a, little bit, a lot lower than that at four. Um, 
I still have my Atari 2600 in the garage. I think I have a 7800 in the garage. Um, I mean, we have fond memories, really, of, of Atari somehow, some way. Even John, if he was here, he would probably talk about an Atari, hopefully. If not, we would have to take him out. It's just a name now. It's a name, but it there's is. still a lot, a lot of history associated it, with that it, name. Yeah, but it's not the same company. No, it doesn't matter. It's still the name. I mean, the the original Atari died years ago. Right. So, but it's so we're we're bowing our heads to a new company that just grabbed that mantle and accomplished. That's very not minimal. necessarily. What if? What if we don't? I mean, just because. But it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to happen all over again. Look, Atari's yeah. going to. Atari's filed for Chapter 11. They're going to reorganize. They're going to focus on mobile gaming. They're going to come out of this, and they're going to be okay. And then in in another couple of years, somebody else will buy them up. They'll change their name to be Atari. And same. And it's just going to keep happening. That's what happens with these old names. They never, ever die. Uh, we haven't seen a Sega console. Uh, we've... No, but we still see Sega games. Have yeah. you seen a, an Atari console? But no, I mean, we haven't really seen any old Atari games, though, be re-released, have we? Yeah, we had new those, Atari yeah. games the, the, well, on not, the console. New, not new on the console. No. Uh, what I'm trying to remember. Not what the mobile. Last... I just read they made they. Well, shift, they did Neverwinter Nights. They and shifted to mobile. Never. I think it was Neverwinter Nights two because they held the D and D license. The Neverwinter Nights two, really? I think so. I didn't know that. I want to say they did. Yeah. Maybe it might have been. I mean, new. Sega. They're still making console games. At least they're still. I mean, they're still doing what they originally did. <laughs> you know. But Atari just became a publisher. Yeah. That's all that's all it was. Yeah. Well, regardless and, and I think uh, uh who said it in the uh in the chat well, room? Chewbacca do, uh, 77. It's D&D. the logo. Oh, You're right. There you, oh. there you go, Chase. Test Drive Unlimited 2. Yeah. And Same Ghostbusters man. in 2009. Yeah. Two titles. <laughs> well, Ghost uh Test Drive Unlimited 2 came out last year or in 2011 rather. Um Yar's Revenge, that's old. Uh Neverwinter Nights is another one they're running. They they uh they do D&D online. Yeah. I mean, which monolith? Yeah, they're 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 doing games. They've just refocused on mobile gaming because probably they saw how much money Angry Birds made and wanted some of it. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Uh, on, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week. You know, the the tragedy that occurred at, at Sandy Hook, just terrible. And there's still a lot of fallout happening because of it. Obviously, in the world of of guns, but also in the world of video games. There's, uh, you know, been discussion that, well, you know, if we didn't have violent video games, then uh, the tragedy wouldn't have occurred. Or, That's you know, right. we need to get our kids off we, these violent you know what? stuff. It's, it's, it it's, predates video games. We push, should have put the kibosh on violent comics, uh, Shakespeare oh, plays. Oh, yeah, you're and right. We'd be fine. We'd be a great, we'd be a great, <laughs> totally normal society if we put the kibosh on the violent Shakespeare mo- uh, plays. I know that's, yeah. that's the issue. Never should have let him write a um, Macbeth. It, w- it was okay up till then. And <laughs> well, then um, you know, this is kind of, kind of hypocritical that they want to go after violent video games, but nobody ever really says something about the violence in Hollywood. You can you, you can go after violent video games all you want, but heaven forbid you ever 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 try to change the violence in Hollywood. They started to. They started to acknowledge yeah. at least a little bit. They, they, they acknowledge it. But I, I don't want acknowledgement. So much pushback. Yeah. I don't want I'm, acknowledgement. I'm telling you guys, I want movies, I want the same equalized blame. We gotta stop the violent plays on Broadway. And the heavy metal and the rap music. Like Spider-Man. We gotta kill that Spider-Man play. It's just <laughs> bad news. Nobody's with me. And House Bill that no. was introduced earlier last week. Uh, Mal- Maldex with you. Maldex with you. He says, no one would kill themselves if Shakespeare did not write Hamlet. There um, it is, right there. A bill seeking stricter enforcement of video game ratings was introduced uh, in the House last week by Representative Jim Matheson, a Democrat from Utah. This would require ratings labels on all video games and ban the sale of games rated mature, or adults only to minors, any violators would face a $5,000 fine. Now, remember, video games are rated, uh, and the system is Voluntarily. voluntary. Yeah. Now, here's the other thing, too. Remember, in California, I want to say a couple of years ago, they tried to pass a proposition that was deemed unconstitutional because it violated something called the First Amendment of kids uh, restricting kids buying, uh, I believe it was, mature titles. And uh, because mature titles are for, I believe, 17 and above, uh, or it's, su- that's, it's suggested. That's yeah, suggested. Suggested. Yeah. Uh, but there is, there is no, uh, you know, 
uh, the Supreme Court said, uh-uh, you can't do that, and it was struck down. So obviously now they're trying to do something nationally. I think, in my opinion, Jim Matheson is wasting his time because it's just going to go back to the Supreme Court, and it's going to get shot down again. Well, even if it doesn't go back to the Supreme Court, what's uh, the this the, a lot of stores, retailers, already don't sell these games to minors. Yeah, they have a they, store they, policy. They have a policy that says, and they're allowed to do that. That doesn't break constitutional grounds at all. Nope. Um, they're allowed to do that, and they, they have a store policy that says, we won't sell an, an M or an A-only rated game to, to minors. Right. And it's totally within their rights to do it. That's and correct. it appears to have accomplished... Um, Absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's that's the exact phrase <laughs> I was looking for. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you know what they need? They need this this amazing mouthpiece what, well, oh na- from Florida named Jack Thompson. Stop it! Oh, okay. <laughs> stop! No, that's what no, they I need. We were done giving him press. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, why are you even mentioning not that ready name? To watch the show. Let's not talk about him at all. Don't worry. His his, his mic has now been muted. I can't thank believe oh, he's mentioned so the much. name on this show. You're gonna have to go back and bleep that before you put it out. <laughs> um, I apologize. By the way, I apologize to all the people <laughs> watching and listening right now. Yeah. Um, no, believe me, his mic is muted. Yeah. Look, look go ahead, try to talk, how much John. Funnier yeah. something sounds when somebody is off the mic laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this 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 won't work. Obviously, this is gonna be unconstitutional. It, it definitely will be. Um, it's it's one of those. And it si- doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. The actual problem. This has nothing no. to do with the actual problem of people just having that mindset of I want to kill people. Yeah, it, that's it, what we have. The problem in this country is we don't want violent video games. Come, come on! on! I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we don't we don't want to look at the problem. We don't. We want to find another. We want to blame something else, something easier, something that we can be like, oh, you know, we can. Just restrict sales it's for games. Guns. Yeah, it's we 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 got to ban those guns. I don't want to turn this into guns. Yeah, I don't want to turn this into guns. I'll, um, I'll rant about that for. A I while. do I do a show I do a show on uh, on Thursdays on Jupiter Broadcasting called Unfilter. I've given my opinions about it, um, but not on this show. This, this <laughs> is this is why I'm glad there's a lot more media attention on 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 he- mental health. And that's one thing I wa- I, I did want to say is that instead of spending the money, okay, on trying to ban video games because some lawmaker thinks he's got a freaking PhD and he knows better or he's getting biased uh, reporting, I want an independent party. Oh, wait, that's been done already. Studies have already been done about violent video games, okay? But fine, go ahead and spend the money again about violent video games and then get back to me. And I'm and, and, and go ahead and get back to me and guarantee to me that that money isn't influenced in any way by any political party or agenda. If you can promise me that, then I will take that study on its word. But until well, that happens, it's not going to. No uh, way. No, I, I, th- I think the problem is, and they do this every time, right? Whenever there's something major going on, they always go back and say, "Well, uh, you know, that person had an Xbox in the living room." Oh boy! And it's like, you know what? Game, Xboxes, PlayStation gaming in, in general yeah, Grand is F- so Grand Theft Auto. Prolifer- prolific. It's like saying you know they had a refrigerator the first- in their kitchen. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like now we're gonna make that connection. Refrigerators cause violence in schools, and we should just get rid of them all. Yep, a hundred percent of murderers breathe air. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all <laughs> murderers you- breathe air. Only non-air breathing Americans should have the right to vote. Uh, you don't realize something. Cars kill people, and we have more car deaths every year than than guns. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite. Come on. One of my my my, my favorite. Banned stats, cars. One of, one of the the best stats I've I've always looked at. Or I've I've always thought was interesting was during any almost anywhere we've had at least since Vietnam. There have been more deaths of American civilians in car accidents than there were military servicemen overseas in that year. Yeah. Like like so in during Vietnam, the the example there was in one year there were more deaths from car accidents than there were during the entire Vietnam War of American soldiers. Yeah. So yeah, let, we should crack down on cars. That's what we should do. Yep, uh, I I totally agree with you, Joe. Yeah. Cars. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to own a car unless you can. <laughs> Why prove does you none can drive of this hypocrisy ever get to Congress? <laughs> because here's the problem. And I'm going to get real political for a, a brief moment. You have money involved in lobby groups that that you know make sure to donate money towards advertising to keep these guys in office. That's why you have uh, an approval rating of Congress of oh I don't know what is it eighteen percent. I I don't on know a good day, maybe yeah. maybe on a good it day. Become a politics show 
No, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is if, if anybody wants to make any significant change about video game policy, you know, kids that are over the age of 18, guess what? You can vote. Vote for people that are not stupid, okay? Yeah. My games. Come on. My country. I mean, it's, it's always amazing to see turnout numbers because they're always <laughs> in the low 20%. Yeah. And, you know, with, with numbers that low, just a, a, a couple hundred thousand people can make a huge difference nationwide on a vote. Yep. Because the yep. turnouts are that low and because some of the races are so close. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely yep. right. Uh, that's it. I'm going to put the ban hammer on Congress. Congress, you've now been banned from the chat room. Sorry. All Sorry, right, guys. Our final gaming story is a hardware-related story. Lenovo, which, uh, you know, talking about... Why is this our final story? Because uh, of time. Yeah, but it's a it's not that interesting a story. Well, yeah, let's skip to the next one. No, yeah, ben. I think the next one's a better story. No, <laughs> no it's not. This yes, is... it is. All right, fine. It will allow us to rage against yet one more thing. Uh, in this I don't want to keep yes. raging, but go I ahead. Love rage That's the episode. best part. I was well, trying. If, I was trying to bring this down about this, softly. We're going to rage about Lenovo. I don't really care. What I, we're this gonna, is why gonna... I come to the show is to rage about. We stuff. were going to rage. Perfect. Guys, 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 stop fighting. Can we all just get along? All right. No, we all want to rage. I, I don't want to see anybody pull a gun and start killing people here. That's it. I'm rage quitting. I'm done. F it. We'll do it live. All right. All right. Go ahead, Good Joe. Enough. Go ahead. So we're going to talk about the about the uh, the the new this other story, not Lenovo. All right. You you okay, introduce we'll, it. We'll talk about Lenovo real quick. They introduced the gaming <laughs> laptop that nobody's going to buy. There we go. Um, hey, you know you can shut his mic off too. Uh, That's true. All right, but go ahead, Joe. So the, the this story we added kind of late. I think it's a, a good one. Somebody uh, I can't remember who in the chat room. Sorry, I can't remember you. Oh, um, J Jay Huckabee. Huckabee. <laughs> uh, but um, the SimCity beta opens up really soon. Uh, if you're one of those people who pre-ordered it and you're willing to use Origin still. Um, well, you have no choice if you want to play it, but yes, you're right. Well, if you're willing to use Origin, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it opens up pretty soon, but there's a really funny, uh, really kind of interesting clause in the uh, license agreement that people have discovered. Specifically, and I'll, I'll read this uh, really word for word what it says. It is, it is in your responsibility to report all known bugs, abuse of bugs, undocumented features, or other defects and problems related to the game and beta software to EA as soon as they are found, which is not that bad. Okay, that makes sense. You're, that's you're, not you're, too. That's not terrible. You're you playing know, a beta you game. Report bugs. Yeah. You're playing a beta. You should report bugs. Of course. The next line is the disturbing one. If you know about a bug or have heard about a bug and fail to report the bug to EA, we reserve the right to treat you no differently from someone who abuses the bug. You acknowledge that EA reserves the right to lock anyone caught abusing the bug out of all EA games. So there you go. If you play SimCity and you find a bug in the game and you don't report it, EA could ban you from playing every other EA game out there. I think they would only ban you if they knew that you exploited that bug. It it says that ex failing to report a bug and is they will be treating it the same way as as someone who abuses the bug. But how would they know? How would they even know? Um, maybe they're going to put up statistics. the obvious bug in there and see how many people report it. <laughs> oh, wait. Well, you sent him statistics. That's right. So, like, you know, if they see, man, why does he keep trying to build that building every single time? <laughs> hmm. Oh, so, ban him. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is just another, you know, super stringent ULA. And I think we're going to see this in more stuff. I, I wonder if we're going to see this in any final release games. Oh, same hey, sort of language. Hey, Joe, 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 don't forget. Yeah. You, you don't have a class action status anymore. Um, you can't. Yep. You can't, you can't do EA. that. You can't sue EA. But uh, you can't get into a class action with them. And if you want to sue them, you have to go to binding arbitration. That's right. Which is usually ninety eight percent in their favor. Right. Well, they get to pick the arbiter. Oh, that's and right. Where the arbitration happens, and who their representative is on Fiji. And yeah, it, it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. All these I'm going to play devil's advocate here just just for the sake of having fun. Okay. You know, I this is not a big deal. I think this is obviously legalese that some bright, you know, Harvard bred, sorry for all you Harvard schooled people, uh, Harvard bred lawyer that is out there uh, working at EA, putting this in there saying, hey, you know, we need to really, really protect ourselves and leave ourselves a clause in case someone is being really, really bad with our game and exploiting it or sharing bugs and exploiting it. This is just a protectionary measure. Will they actually ban a beta user from uh, from SimCity? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen. This is just 
They should well, have just let you guys. I, I, you know what? I think they're, they'll to use this as, to as a with go-to excuse to ban somebody that they don't like. All right, say that one more time, Joe, because John was talking real quick. Oh, sorry. I think they'll use this as a go-to excuse for banning somebody they don't like. Oh, so just based on attitude. Yeah, well, I mean, no. So, like, uh, as an example, you remember I got banned from uh, Battlefield 3. Oh, that's right. For apparently no for, reason. For hacking. I never, right. ever heard why. Right. Um, And, uh, and... You know, they they if I if I actually had talked or if somebody had been willing to talk to me at EA or Dice or whoever it was that was involved, um, they probably would have used some some stupid excuse in the EOLA as the reason that I got banned, even though it probably wouldn't have applied. It's a catch all that you can't prove or disprove that somebody fell into that category. So it's an easy way to say, look, yeah, this is I how remember. it is, and you agreed to the end the, the EOLA, so bye. But see, if they do ban you. Does that preclude you from not suing them or exclude you from... You suing? agreed to the EULA that includes a, a, a clause in there that says you can't sue them. But you doesn't can't that, be involved in a class action against them. But doesn't that release you once they ban you? No. No, no, no. The, often, m on nine times out of ten, these EULAs say that even if EAs or even if the, 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 the publisher's side of things fall through or they abandon the agreement, you don't have any right to uh, abandon as well. Wow. So, I mean, no, th these things are all written specifically for the company and never for the user. And that's, I mean, that's I'm just, just trying to figure out why something. you even care if you're, you're not even going to be a beta tester. So I am. I'm going to be a beta tester. I'm going to try to be. Anyway. But you obviously don't care. If, no. if, if I if I manage to become a beta tester for SimCity, I would have to have I would set up a second uh, origin account just to beta test SimCity. And well, he would well, use you your name, it. John Bub. He would sit, type in yeah, John no, Bub. I, I mean, yeah. Because, fine, because what happens if, if they decide <laughs> that, that you did something, you know, that you didn't report the bug that they purposely put in the game that's really obvious? They would they knock on your door. Before. They would say, excuse me, sir, we would like the computer, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. We put EA would do that, and as soon as they stepped on my property, I would shoot them. With the gun that the government wants to ban. Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> well, see, I can just shoot. I live in shoot Oregon where our sheriffs fraud. believe that we have the right. I know. I saw that, by the way. That was that was very good. <laughs> I like that. Oh, Maldek. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> John Carlo. Yes. John Carlo. Finish off this topic, please. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to repeat what Maldek said on IRCs. I want to beta test assault rifles. Mow down a shopping mall and report it as a bug. Oh, bad. <laughs> that's, that's, that's terrible. That's, that's not how you finish off a top. <laughs> no, that's not right. No. I, I, just, I just worry because this, this legalese is going to be perpetuated probably not just from EA, but we've seen the same kind of perpetuation to Ubisoft. Well, one thing we have seen, though, which you know does show strength in numbers, is when there's a lot of buzz and a lot of press about it. Yeah. And a lot of people jump on board. I mean, look what happened with the whole Instagram fiasco, <laughs> uh, where Instagram, uh, you know, there was confusion. There was some wording in the terms of service where, you know, people thought that they didn't own their photos anymore and people were leaving Instagram in droves. And it got so much buzz that things changed. And so things can change, believe it or not. And well, if, and, and if, but, gamers, but Instagram isn't. But if gamers got together and they, they generated the same amount of buzz and same amount of attention to this topic, I bet you that EA would make a change. But, you know, well, and, EA's and, you user know, base is so massive that a lot of those those gamers are not going to care. It's only the hardcore that's gamers. That's the problem. Yeah. That's the major but, problem. But, again, but it still depends on the on the games and, and who's doing it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned um, Ubisoft put in there the same sort of language and they put in there always on DRM and stuff like that. And they, after some big backlash, they've really relaxed all that stuff. They don't That's have true. the same always on DRM. They don't have the same stuff in their newer games. They've gotten better. Yeah, I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not going to say any game developer except Steve, except Valve is perfect. Um, but they've gotten a lot better. Yeah, actually, no, not even Valve's perfect, but they're a lot better yeah, than so most I, of the other ones. You know, I do agree with you that a lot of people, a lot of gamers, should rise up and say, you know, we're not going to take this anymore by not buying games specifically from EA because these guys are reaming the gamers for for any sort of freedom that they have over their product. Right. And that's just, that's just Yeah, I mean, before practice. too long, it's they're going to include a clause that says you can buy the game for 50 bucks, but you have to buy the first two DRM packs for 10 bucks a piece, I mean, or we'll, we'll cancel your license. If, if you guys went to LA Fitness or, or some gym or something, and they said, you know, if you, if you see a machine that's not working right and you don't report it, we're going to... Sorry, go we're ahead. Gonna, Sorry, <laughs> we're gonna ban you from our gym. Would you take that? 
can you even take that? I, I don't know if that's even legal. Exactly. So how is this legal at all? I Well, it's it's more than that though. It's it's you go you sign up for a gym and they you discover that one of the machines is broken. You don't fill out a report the machine is broken. They kick you out of the out of the place and then they kick you out of every other gym that they're connected to. Yeah. Right? You can never join another gym that they're connected to. Yeah. Oh man, you guys. You Sorry. guys. Man. Great send off. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's one for the books. We should yeah. we should yeah, re- I just, keep that in the highlights. Joe just lets it all out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? I mean, don't we don't we all just let it go? Uh-huh. Just let it go, people. No. All right. No, I think I think I don't think so. Uh, up wrong uh, wrong think- lower third up there. Let me uh let me pull up our lower third that should be the right one. There he is. All right. It's now time for our picks of the week. These are highlighting things in the technology field, the gaming field. This could be a news story. Really, it's a pick that we individually made as a free, loving society that we do here on the show. So we'll we'll start off with one of our remote guests, and that's going to be Mr. John Bubb from GFQ Network. John, what's your pick of the week? All right, so uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before that I, over the weekend I've been building a computer, and so I've been like researching parts, trying to pick parts out, trying to compare prices, trying to find the lowest price for parts. One of the ways that I've done that is with an extension for Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. It's called Invisible Hand. I've heard of this. This is awesome. You can get it at getinvisiblehand.com. And like I said, it's an extension and installs right in there. So whenever you go to a site like Amazon or Best Buy or Buy.com or even Newegg, it'll actually bring up a bar along the top of your screen, and it'll search every other site that it's connected to and find you lowest prices. It'll tell you whether or not it's the same price everywhere else or if they found a lower price. So it's very makes comparison shopping, price comparison shopping, very, very, very easy. This is a now, I, so now, this- now, now. Wait a minute. Before I, I'm a little skeptical because here's what I want to know. Can you tell me, John, that if let's say, for example, I go to Amazon, okay, yeah. and it says, oh, the price is cheaper on Buy.com, are they getting a referral credit for that? Um, I, I honestly don't know. That's what I would want to know, because, for example. Um, I use sometimes, uh, and we have them here on our channel. I use re, uh, referral credits, uh, referral links. Uh, so, for example, uh, I know you know. Say, for example, I can't do referral links on my own site. You don't get credit for. It. So, if I wanted to use GFQ's referral link on Amazon, but if I had this invisible hand on there, would that supersede that? That's that's what I would want to know. Yes. Well, they they do have a. It appears that they do that. Um, okay. In their fact, it says, if you buy a product after clicking on the button and invisible head notification, the retailer or seller pays us a small commission. Aha. So they are using the referral links, and that's how they're paying for their So it's, their it's a, what's going to uh, kick off the other, uh, probably kick away the other referral link. Well, it's important that this is if you if you click that button. So if you um, if you if you go to Amazon, I have to assume this, I don't know, but if you go to Amazon using someone else's referral link and you buy something there. Right. If the uh, unless the bar tells you there's a lower price somewhere else and you still buy from Amazon, they they can't take that referral away. That's correct. But yeah, if they popped up a thing that said, "Hey, you could get this hard drive cheaper over at Newegg," uh, then and you click on it, then yeah, they'll get the referral from Newegg, as opposed to if you use some other way to do it. It still makes comparison shopping. No, very, I agree. Very, very oh yeah, easy. yeah, yeah. I no, agree. I, I think it's a, well, it's, I, a, I, it's a great idea. Yeah, just the one thing that worries me is it makes it so easy that people who you know love like those referral links, like GFQ and Geek Gamer TV, could potentially mm-hmm. miss out on that when you have a, a browser plugin that pulls that away. Um, you know, that's that's just the one thing that worries me. That's all. <laughs> I mean, I love the idea. I think it's a great pick, and I want to install it. On my thing, but the problem is I may become so enamored in clicking that banner that when I do my shopping at at Amazon, I'll forget to and I won't use the link that you guys provide as an example. You know, I see a lot of times though is that it, even if you go to the listing on Amazon, I still buy it from Amazon, even even though it might say a lower price somewhere else. That's yeah, true. And for me, it's yeah. it's the same way as I'll research a product on like I've I've done PC builds on on Newegg and picked out all the parts I want. And then I'll go find them on Amazon, and if they're the same price or, or oftentimes a little cheaper, I'll just buy them there. Yeah, because I can get the free second day shipping and all those kind of things. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. 
So. I, one thing I would also want to know is if you had a plugin installed that automatically generated the referral for, uh, affiliate referral link, like if you had a plugin, like when you go to Amazon, it would automatically insert that code. I wonder if these two would fight over each other. <laughs> I don't, that'd be so interesting. Uh, but we anyway, find out. yeah, it's a great pick though. I mean, I don't want to dog your pick. I'm just, I'm a little concerned for the people that use the, you know, the referral, referral income, you know, uh, and you know, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see your point, but at the same time, it's just, you, you can have it both ways. I think. Yeah, absolutely. In, in the sense that a lot of times that I honestly use this, just use to, it on the sites. Look at Amazon. Yeah. Use it on the sites that we don't use. Is a lower price anywhere else. Use You're it. saving money. Actually, Stop you, whining. You use it on uh, use it on sites that we don't use, like uh, airplane travel sites or you know JetBlue, JetBlue, American <laughs> Airlines, right. United. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Sears, Sears. <laughs> yeah, no one shops at Sears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to use this clip as a uh, pick of the week <laughs> separately. <laughs> I'd be so killed. <laughs> well, great pick though. Awesome pick. And if you want to give it a try yourself. The website is getinvisiblehand.com. All right. Sounds like a porn site. It's a porn site. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. John Carlo, what's your pick of the week? Now, you know I'm a big racer, and you know I'm always looking for the, the most immersion in, in a racing setup or chassis or something like that. My pick of the week doesn't have so much to do with that. Uh, it's somewhat indirect. Okay. It's called Galvanic Vestibular Stimulation. Gesundheit. If it this actually uh, was kind of news uh, a while back, but it wasn't really picked up anywhere and, and wasn't really uh, useful or anything uh, other than you know the technology. So I'm I'm looking at a video clip that looks like it's like 1985, but it's really <laughs> yes. 2009. And yeah. what is this? And so this this is a controlling of the. Or I'll, I'll read it off the wiki. Okay. Uh, Galvanic stibu uh, vestibular stimulation is the process of sending specific electric messages to the nerve in the ear that maintains balance. Okay. Now, this is really interesting because you can remote control somebody. Oh, really? Yes. That's what I was going to ask. So what, what these guys do in the video is, it, you'll, you'll see in the video that they he's can got an air He's got a model airplane controller. Exactly. And then the, this person is wearing a wearable computer with some, what looks like open ear headphones. Okay. And he's got some little nerve, uh, which we call them, little Whoa. Things, like, attached to the, uh, the outside of the skin and send electric signals. Well, when he moves the stick, that's where you feel like you're drawn to. And why is this interesting? Well, because of, of a recent technology that was kickstarted called Oculus Rift, in combination with this kind of technology would be a massive improvement in immersion of not just immersion in visually looking around, but feeling things that you're that you're doing. So the uh what's his name? Palmer, the the actually the CEO of Oculus Rift, uh has been researching this technology and is looking to possibly be including it into a version of Oculus Rift. Okay. So how does this help? Well, racing for one. You don't need a motion rig anymore. You would actually just feel compelled to be moving left or right. You know what scares me here, Giancarlo? What's that? Why do I feel like at some point the government's going to mandate that we <laughs> implant something? Yes. And this is how they control us. Weapon. Yeah. Now, if they expanded this technology to cell phones and like the uh, the designer oh, said God. and said, why don't... That's if, why if, the iPhone 5 is so popular. <laughs> now you, it makes sense. If, if you watch this video, the, the, the designer of this technology actually says, uh, we would like... How cool it would be if you were walking and you needed directions to someplace and you actually just started walking towards where you needed to be. What right. if those directions were wrong like a GPS is wrong? How oh, bad would that? That would be bad. <laughs> but still cool. But, but very cool for entertainment purposes. I mean, you could you could simulate G-force effects without actually having G-force effects yourself. Cool, which is really So really why convenient. so obviously this is uh, the reason why you picked this was just because of the Oculus is is that the reason? Mostly because I you know, I was thinking about the Oculus and it, it's great to look around and, and feel like you're immersed, but you're not feeling any effects. And I, I started thinking about, you know, uh, SIM chassis and how, you know, you get a four-point uh, SIM chassis and it's 
it feels all right, but it can't really simulate like uh, loss of uh, of uh, the rear end, like traction, con- like traction on the wheels or anything like that, or, or g forces when you're sitting. And there's there's a, a seat that kind of simulates that, but how cool would it be to actually feel like you're actually feeling those? Yeah, without yeah. having anything around you. Yeah, no kidding. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Man. Well, great pick, and we'll actually. Well, what we'll do for you guys, we won't make you do all the uh, heavy lifting. We'll put a link in our show notes and for all the information of big words that you may not understand <laughs> <laughs> at, a, at our website at geekgamer.tv. Nice pick, Giancarlo. All right, Mr. Joe, you're up next, buddy. What's your pick of the week? So this was kind of a cool thing that happened uh, in, in Portland, town near me. Okay. And Portland is is one of the, the names for it is... Uh, is called the city of bridges. We have a yeah, you have uh, a lot of bridges. ridiculous number of bridges that cross the Willamette River, running right through the center of town. Yeah, and um, well, a lot of these bridges are fairly old, and and they've different ones are in, are in different states of repair. One of the oldest is called the Selwood Bridge, and uh, it was made in 1925. Wow, um, original constructed in 1925, and it is a two lane bridge that I've driven across, and man, it feels hairy as all heck. Um, driving across that bridge. Well, it's um, it's slated to go away. Oh. They're they're actually going to replace the bridge. They're going to tear the old bridge down. They're going to put a new, fancy, really cool looking. I've seen some of the the renderings for it. it looks like a beautiful arch bridge uh, that they're going to replace it with. Okay. But in the meantime, they want to keep that road open. Of course. So what they did yeah. is one of it's one of the biggest moves in history. They moved this six point eight million pound, eleven hundred foot long steel truss bridge. Off to the side. They shifted it. <laughs> what? Um, they actually shifted it over, uh, I think it's like 12 feet or something like that. And, uh, or no, it's further than that. They shifted it quite a long ways. Okay. Um, twenty uh, About 20 feet. And um, made it so that it's the temporary. Now, the old bridge is the temporary bypass to allow cars to still use that route while they build the new bridge over the next couple of years. I see. So they built uh, temporary iron supports and then they slid it over. Yeah. Wow! So they they built some new supports in the river, and they slid the bridge off the old concrete um, concrete abutments, the old the old concrete uh, pillars and stuff like that, and uh, built new ramps that go onto the old bridge and uh, in the lo- new location. And they spent uh, basically all day Saturday shifting the bridge over twenty feet, um, but six point eight million pounds. It took them uh, it took them almost all day to move, and uh, eleven hundred feet long. And they had to arrange it so that it all moved smoothly and and didn't break. All right here. Here's a stupid question. It's probably already been answered somewhere. Yes. But why didn't they just build the new bridge next to the old bridge? Well, um, so the approaches and, and stuff like that from both ends are already where they want them to be. They don't want to have to move the, the, the approaches for the bridge. There's a road, road alignment and issues like that. Okay. And so it makes more sense to to have a temporary bridge cars can use while they're building the new bridge. And um, this saves them significant amounts of money because they don't have to build a whole big new temporary bridge. They just move the old one over, and uh, and then they can get starting on construction for the new one right away. So they're um, they're going to use this. Uh, this bridge is going to go until about the summer of 2015, this, this temporary old bridge, and that should be when the new one opens. But they have a, a really cool video on the, on the webpage um, for... Uh, uh, for, that actually shows a time lapse um, of uh, it's on it's on I just posted the page that it's on uh, shows a time lapse of the bridge actually moving ever so slowly sliding across and uh, they started it on the nineteenth at eight thirty and they finished um, I, I can't remember when they said they finished but it, it took twelve to sixteen hours and uh, it's just I just think it's fantastic just one of these cool engineering things that, that I like engineering things I mean for people if people know me and they actually if they play in the Minecraft server they already do I like building roads and bridges yeah, just, this is this I'll is do a that all bit, day this is a little bit more serious I know than just building but still a bridge cool. that, uh, building a road yeah. in Minecraft but yeah but yeah I mean it's it's fantastic and and uh, you know it's a it's a really good first step in replacing this this, this antique bridge you know, built in 1925, and it's it's well due for replacement. They've had some structural questions about it for a while now. So Joe Huckabee's right. They should have had this on Extreme Engineering and Discovery. They should have got that guy <laughs> with the hard hat out there. And 
what they're well, doing. Well, who knows? I mean, they they may cover it on a future episode. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, this is the first step in the whole construction project. They so got to move they, it back. Well, no, they don't have to move this <laughs> no. back. They they have to use this temporarily and then get rid of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, but they, I mean, they. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody does a a, a story about it eventually. Um, after they've done the new bridge, it would be really cool to see a, a, a you know, like a documentary about the the construction process and stuff like that. But this is just one of several bridge projects that are going on in Portland right now. There's also a pedestrian and a TriMet bridge that's going in. It's going to be light rail and pedestrian crossing. Yeah, I saw I saw one of the pictures from uh, Joe Huckabee in the chat room of the new bridge that yeah. they're building. Yeah, the, there's a there's a, a the the actual page um, the Sel, uh, SelwoodBridge.org has a, a page with artist renderings and stuff like that of what the new bridge is going to look like. And I, I think the new bridge looks fantastic. Um, but again, it's it's a, it's just such a cool thing. I mean, how often do you get to see or hear about uh, something that weighs um, 6.9 million pounds and is 1,100 feet long, moving 20 feet? Um, aircraft I mean, carriers? Uh, <laughs> I don't think aircraft carriers are quite that size. Are they eleven hundred? Are are they are they six point nine million pounds? I don't know. I don't know. But if you guys, but the other thing too is aircraft carriers are really designed to move. <laughs> um, a bridge, yeah, not usually designed to move. <laughs> well, you guys, if you want more information, and no doubt, if you're an engineering geek, you will. We'll have a link in our show notes at geekgamer.tv. Joe, I appreciated the pick. Maybe some of the other guys didn't, but I did. I enjoyed it. I thought it, it was cool. I so, thought it was cool okay, too. so aircraft carriers. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. I just want to point this out. The U.S., uh, the standard for a supercarrier is 70,000 long tons. Wow. So, um, not quite. No, not even, not even <laughs> close. <laughs> All right. I, I, like, I, like the, I like this, fra- this uh, paragraph here, and it says, Damage to the heavy concrete supports on the west end. Caused by continuing movement of an ancient landslide on the slopes above, required repeated treatments of industrial glue to prevent collapse. <laughs> hey. And on that note, let's move on to the final was, pick of the probably, week. It was probably Gorilla Glue. <laughs> My pick of the week is an app uh, that you can uh, grab. It's a it's a it's an Apple only app. So sorry, Android fans out there, uh, but it's a very good app, Boo. and I like it very very much. It's called Card Munch. It's uh, by the makers of LinkedIn. You've probably heard of that website. It's a uh, website, you know, where uh, you know that social media thing, and you connect with other professional employees, and you connect with companies. It's it's think of it as Facebook for professionals. And uh, this app, and really, there's not much to show on this web page, but what this app does, and this is why I love it so much. It's free. You uh, and I'm gonna. I'll do a live demonstration here. Uh, I know that this gentleman probably won't mind it, uh, but what it does is it takes a picture of any business card. Uh, so, for example, um, I have uh, Alex Gumpel, a friend of the show, uh, his business card here from Twit, and uh, got the app booted up here. I'll long- I hit the camera button, and you'll see here. That uh, oh wow that's kind of weird it's a it's me and me uh you you take a picture of the card so, me chase yeah yeah it's me me so I'm gonna take a picture of the of the uh, let it focus there there's a picture I got the the card there in the frame and then I'll hit upload and then now that it's uploaded it gets transcribed now I don't know if the app itself is transcribing it. Or someone somewhere is transcribing it. I really don't know the secret sauce behind the scenes. I don't really care. What happens is, after a while, after the transcription is done, you will uh, get a, uh, a list of names. Okay, I'll just kind of scroll through them real quick here. Of all the cards that you downloaded. Oh, there's a how it works? Yeah. Th- there was no links on that page. Uh-oh. It says real humans do it. <laughs> really? Real yeah. humans. You didn't try Googling? Supposed to fake ones. No. <laughs> so what happens is uh, it will it will add those uh, basically in the app. So I'm going to uh, select somebody here real quick. Um, I'll select Alex because I already did his card earlier. So what it does is if they're on LinkedIn and you're not connected to them, it will bring up their LinkedIn profile and offer you to connect with them. Um, if uh, you already are connected with them, uh, you'll obviously you'll see all their information there, but also you'll have the ability to take that information that you scanned off the business card and put it right into your iPhone's address book. 
Um, also, uh, it always will keep a picture of that business card there with you. And then when you're all said and done, you can take these business cards, either recycle them, keep them, store them. Uh, but the best part is, you know, like if you're going to a major trade show or conference like E3 or PAX, which, you know, Joe and I and uh, oh, some guy named uh, Josh Cohen went uh, and John Kessler, we, you know, we get a lot of business cards. So this makes a really easy and efficient way to keep all the information, save all the information. Now, you do need a LinkedIn account to use it, uh, but it is free. And you can go to cardmunch.com. There's a link directly to the App Store and we'll also have a link in our show notes to exactly how it works, but it's it's uh, it's crazy. It's people. Go figure that one out. Cool. Yeah, you have any questions about it? No, nope, nobody does. Cool. Cool. They have a nice little video on their website too that shows. See, about. I went to their website. Look, I mean, look, this is how bad it is. I went to their website. Yeah. The only thing is, there's a the link there that says download the app. Yeah, that's what I'm getting right now. There's no other link to how it works or what it does or burp -a -dip -a -dip. Bad website design. Well, no, I think it's it, it card munch. I think predates LinkedIn. Okay, but and so it was its own thing, and they had their own website set up, and then they were acquired by LinkedIn, and they added a little powered by LinkedIn, and then LinkedIn said we don't like your web page and redid the front page, but left all the other stuff behind. Right. Hey, look, they're making a BlackBerry app. Sure, they are. I mean, there are other apps uh, that <laughs> there are other apps that do the same thing, but since I you know I use LinkedIn uh, for a lot of professional contacts. It just works for me. But there's other apps to do similar things. Uh, but, yeah, Card Munch, if you want more information, we'll have a link in our show notes, cardmunch.com. And that's it for this edition of Geek Gamer Weekly. I want to say a, a big thank you to uh, our guests. First off, starting off here with Mr. Giancarlo Lenzi, the GSRC. I just put in your lower third president of operations. Sweet. So uh, congratulations on the title. Sweet. Um, you, I wanted to tell, just spend a couple of minutes real quick. I know there's no website or anything formally <laughs> for it, uh, even though I'm telling you to, that you need one. I don't even know if we should announce it right now. Maybe we should wait. You don't even tell, want to tell people. Well, you did tell what the acronym stood for at the beginning of the show. Oh, yeah, that's true. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so. Well, yeah. you could just say, just say in general terms. Just All right. So, general. um. Me and some friends, uh, we, we got together and we wanted, we were kind of dissatisfied with the current broadcasting of sim racing um, like, broadcasts. Uh, simulated video game racing. Yeah, so video game racing, like like you would see on TVs, you know, people get together and do amateur broadcasts of this stuff. Well, we think we can raise the quality and, and raise, uh, you know, uh, make it a much more exciting and much more involved uh, broadcast. And so we started up what's called the global sim racing channel. Um, and it's just, a, it's a, it's global. We've got a couple of guys in, in Australia, a couple of guys in, in, in the UK um, and, you know, some guys in the United States, uh, East and West coast. And it's, uh, it, it's going great so far. We haven't quite yet. Let's call it a beta. It's in yeah, beta. It's, it's kind of in beta. Uh, nope. we, we did, if, if it's beta, actually, people like D, DX9 in the chat room, he, he was able to see uh, some of uh, a test broadcast that we did uh, that was very, very tested. It, it's not everything that we wanted to include. But people were impressed. But people are impressed. Yeah. And so uh, we want to keep ramping that higher. We want to keep, keep aiming for uh, raising the bar and uh, making the standard of sim racing broadcast. And, and since it is gaming content, uh, mm -hmm. that's something that we're... We're uh, we're showing on our channel. Uh, so if you're up late, late, late this morning, uh, you saw uh, some test feed footage, and it was a lot of fun to do. Uh, so there'll be more information down the road about it. It's in beta. There's no sign up. Sorry, you guys, you can't sign up for the beta <laughs> or anything like that. But it's really cool. Uh, it's a great initiative, and it's something that I'm I'm definitely helping my friend out on giving him tech technical advisement. On things that uh, he, I mean, he's the race car guy. He knows that stuff. But you know, when it comes to internet broadcasting, I, I know a little bit. I and it's very much appreciated. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Do you get banned if you don't report bugs? Yes. Yeah, I do. Actually, I I was banned this morning. <laughs> John, John Bub, uh, you are at the GFQ Network. People can follow you on Twitter at Suncast S U N K A S T. Mm -hmm. You are uh, one of the co-hosts of Tech News Weekly on GFQ. Was there a show on Friday? No, I you didn't know think what? there we, was. We actually decided to 
wait a week because the next episode that we're doing is going to be our 100th episode. So we want to have like this nice big episode that's going to be awesome and whatnot. So who's so going to be on we it? We decided to wait a week. So who's going to be on this 100th episode? We haven't decided yet. Oh, okay. It's a secret. It's a secret. Might be you. It might be. Oh, boy. I'm crossing my fingers. I better get another lottery ticket, see if I'm lucky. Yeah. But John, uh, if you match all the numbers, <laughs> yes. But always a great friend of the show, and uh, you know, thank you so much, man, uh, for for joining us. Do appreciate it, man. Anytime, man. Mister Joe Sefabi, our Oregon Bureau of Technology, Gaming Research, and Development from the confines just south of Portland, Oregon. Thanks so much, man. And uh, as people may or may not realize, you're the co-host of Minecraft Me, not the former lead programmer of Minecraft. Yeah, I have, to, I have to change hats guy. for that. Say again? I, I have to change hats for that. Yeah, you do. What was what were you yelling at, uh, Joe, there, John? Beard and hat guy. Beard and hat yeah, guy. Beard and hat guy, that's right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh you know joe joe's not only a, a great friend and uh, very knowledgeable about minecraft me but also very knowledgeable when it comes to firearms and and guns you know he's a a, a card uh concealed card carrying permit holder is that the proper way of saying I, I guess you could say that yeah <laughs> yeah and we've gone shooting uh it's it's uh, i always love uh, going shooting with joe and you're it's still alive at, well you hush uh Oh man! <laughs> hey, uh, hey, uh, John. Next time you're out here, why don't we go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, see if I ever come to the West Coast. Now, <laughs> have you ever came We're, out to the West Coast? You know, I've actually been to Arizona a long, long time ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh. you're. You probably are. Aren't you in Detroit? Yeah. Uh, oh. You probably put your life in more danger going to Arizona than living in Detroit. Um, <laughs> at least that's my opinion. I have a very oh, low estimation of no Arizona. Uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, over here Detroit, on the we'll on the we'll west coast in Oregon, last. Washington, you know the Pacific Northwest, we like firearms, but we're also safe and uh, and um, conscious of 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 what they are for Safety. and what they can be done. And and yeah, we're we're very aware of that sort of thing. Yeah. So. If you want to come over, if you're uh, if you want to come over here, John, and and hang out, and uh, we'll take you out, and and you can figure out that their firearms, not gats, um, as they are typically called in Detroit, um, <laughs> you know, we'd, be, we'd be more than happy to uh, to show you. I now, now, and also in Detroit, don't they don't they hold the uh, the guns sideways? Yeah, like we'll, that? we'll teach you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you yeah. would want to make fun of them. That was that was right a now. gravity you ever problem come here. in Detroit. Oh, it's a gravity issue. <laughs> yeah, oh, gravity. is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> okay. You know the the funny thing is when you hold your gun sideways like that, depending on the pistol, uh, the brass ejecting will actually hit you right in the face. <laughs> oh. Um. <laughs> so, but yeah, no. Uh, seriously, if you want to come on over and uh, you know spend a day at the range, we can uh, try a few different things. If we can find ammo right now, um, be more than happy to. It'd be a good time. So, always happy to go out shooting. Yeah, and always happy to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, really appreciate. It. We'll see you on Thursday. For, yeah, for some Minecraft me action. Uh, I want to remind everybody uh, that watches this show, we usually do it every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern time at live.geekgamer.tv. And we're also simulcasted when Andrew remembers to put the audio in the right position at gfqnetwork.com. Wait, now wait a minute. In his defense, he did <laughs> okay. say that the board reset. Okay, all right. I'm just, you know, he doesn't watch this show. I don't think he does. So, I don't think so either. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so either. He'll but never see this. So. He'll never see this part. Say, no. say whatever you want about him. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go that far. Because then someone will go, hey, did you see what Jay said about you? No, I'm good friends with Andrew. known him for years and very good guy. Uh, so, And they have lots of great content, so check them you out. You can call him a slut. And you can call him a slut at gfqnetwork.com. By the way... <laughs> uh, our lovely website has a lot of great content. All of our previous episodes of Geek Gamer Weekly, Minecraft Me, gaming and hardware, technology reviews, everything is here at geekgamer.tv. And if you like what we do and you support the idea of independent internet content, head over to geekgamer.tv slash support where you can do a little shopping. If you're going to Amazon.com or Newegg or Monoprice, Come here first, click on the links, and then go do a shopping because part of your experience will go and support us. But if you want, you can always just donate straight cash by clicking the donate button there 
and putting in a donation amount. All the money and all the proceeds go directly go into the infrastructure. They go into creating a great experience for you guys to enjoy. And uh, I especially want to say thank you to all the people who have donated and, and done that. You know, really, it helps tremendously. And uh, shout out also, by the way, to all the people hanging out with us on this Monday evening as we record this in our chat room. You guys rock. Thanks for staying up with us. We do appreciate it. For Mr. Joe Falby, John Bub, John Carlo Lindsay, and uh, oh yeah, that guy, John Kessler, who couldn't make it tonight. My name is Chase Nunes. Thanks for watching Geek Gamer Weekly. Until we all talk again, we are until we until we talk again, we are all silent. Hey Joe, say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. Charlton Heston. Ha <laughs>